Well, first of all, thanks everybody for joining us here tonight on Zoom for APC's third Tuesday lecture. Um, it seems a, a strange time we are in, but on the other hand, how fantastic that uh, our speaker's father and sister and so many others can join from uh, far afield. Um, my name is Petra Leshevsky. I'm on the board of APC. And uh, before I introduce Kate, there was one other thing. I wanted to ask Bonnie Landers, our president at the Alaska Photographic Center, whether there are any announcements, Bonnie, that you would like to make before I introduce Kate. No, I think we can get going and uh, okay. just check the website for the upcoming um, monthly Zoom meetings. We've got a good lineup coming up. Okay, and that's uh, third um, Tuesday, so look out for, for that. Um, Kate has a, a long list of accomplishments. She is, to me, a little bit of a Renaissance woman. I've known her, like I said earlier, for almost 25 years. We met in a workshop when um, I was just starting to get serious about photography, and she was far ahead, and... Um, she, uh, she always had this wonderful eye and this ability to see other people's work and give advice, good advice, really um, constructive advice. And I benefited from that. So thank you, Kate. Um, she has uh, shown in the state, in many shows, she's shown um, in, the, in the nation and also internationally, she's been published and um, she has recently been involved in some interesting projects um, that I know she's going to talk about tonight. So I, um, th there's the um, uh, Journal Collective and then Women Photograph that I think we're going to hear about and probably other, other things as well. But uh, I'm excited to introduce uh, Kate Salisbury Wool. Thank you so much for doing this tonight, Kate. And uh, we can't wait. So uh, the ether is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'll share my screen now. And Jason, you can let me know if it's a success. It is successful. OK. Hello, my name is Kate Wool. I've been a photographer in Alaska since 1990. My photography is fine art, photojournalism, editorial, commercial, fashion, photo illustration, or anything else that might come my way. This is a self-portrait from a couple years ago in an oil slick in the parking lot. Tonight, I'm going to share pandemic photography a year of isolation, innovation, collaboration, and connection to photography and art around the globe. Please let me know if the slideshow is too fast, as I know internet speeds vary. I've tried to give 10 seconds a slide average um, to help with that. The photographs might seem all over the place, but remember, all of these are ongoing works in progress, and they're only a year old. My hope is that you will get insight into how these photo photographic projects and art have evolved and how the inner workings of my brain and putting them together works. Before I begin, I'd like to give a brief background of two important organizations that will come up in this presentation. The first is Women Photograph. Women Photograph is a nonprofit that launched in 2017 to elevate the voices of women and non-binary visual journalists. This private database includes more than a thousand independent document documentary photographers based in 100 plus countries and is available privately to any commissioning editor or organization. Women Photograph also operates an annual series of project grants, a year long mentorship program, annual skills building workshops, and a travel fund to help women and non-binary photographers access professional development opportunities. Their mission is to shift the makeup of the photojournalism community 
and ensure that our industry's chief storytellers are as diverse as the communities that they hope to represent. They believe that inclusion and equity work must be fully intersectional and are committed to supporting and highlighting photographers across the spectrum of all identities. They are particularly committed to centering the voices of women and non-binary photographers of color and pledge that more than half of their funding and opportunities will go to black indigenous people of color photographers. The Women Photograph website, womenphotograph.com has a lot of data on it. But one of the things that most interesting is the A1 lead photo bylines by gender percentages. The reason they established Women Photograph um, in 2017 was because of these graphics. <laughs> you can see here, and I'll just um, talk about some of the small words because I know some of you are on smaller monitors. The men photographers are in the dark blue. The uncredited unknown photographers are in the middle in the light blue, and you can see the women in the lightest blue. So the San Francisco Chronicle has the most equity and this is 2020. So if you go back in time before women photograph started, the percentages are even smaller. So the San Francisco Chronicle has 43% women, A1 lead photo bylines, New York Times 29%, Washington Post 24%, LA Times 20%, Globe and Mail 14%, Wall Street Journal 11%, Le Monde 10% and The Guardian 8%. So you can see the inequity of uh, female representation in storytelling. The Women Photograph website uh, offers, these are just screenshots from the website. So you can go to the website yourself. You can see who's in the database in Africa, Asia, Middle East, the USA, which actually has four pages. I think I'm on page number two. Um, Canada, Latin America, Europe, and Oceania, and then they have a special page um, uh, dedicated to women and people, women in, of color. Because these are screenshots, there's some portions of photographs on the bottom, so I apologize to the photographers for that. The one thing this has been great for for me is access to data. So because I'm a member of Women Photograph, I can go to the private portions of this website and there's lists of photo editors, what their contacts are, how much they pay for stories and whether they're uh, good at getting back to you for pitches or not. So it's been a really great resource for my photography. The second organization I want to talk about is Four Freedoms. Four Freedoms is an artist-led organization that models and increases civic joy, discourse, and direct action. We work with artists and organizations to center the voices of artists in public discourse, expand what participation in a democracy looks like, and reshape conversations about politics. So like the Women Photograph Group, which I joined in 2017, I partnered with Four Freedoms in 2018. In 2018, I partnered with Four Freedoms for their very first ever 50 state initiative, which featured more than 100 billboards in all 50 states, Washington DC, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the US Virgin Islands, um, the month before the 2018 election. In February of 2020, 500 delegates from this 2018 collective converged at the Four Freedoms Conference in Los Angeles, our collective excitement, a powerful declaration of the world we were building together. And then the pandemic hit. This, the timeline of this presentation starts February 28, 2020, where I went to LA for the Free, Four Freedoms Congress. My I Am Not a Target project was part of the 2018 50 State Initiative, and I went to LA to share the successes from this partnership. For those of you that might not be familiar with this project, I'll just read a brief summary about it because it's very important to me. The I Am Not a Target project invites participants to pose for Art for Change events held around Alaska. Activists pose with targets on their chests 
representing how they feel every day, Congress does nothing to enact gun safety legislation. Posters were made like this one sent to Alaska congressional delegates displayed as indoor bill billboards for the 2018 50 state initiative. And we also had a, a town hall and it was used to promote gun safety education. At the Four Freedoms Congress, February 28th, 2020, right when the pandi pandemic was in, was hitting the US, I was in LA sharing the success of this project. In response to this project, this is what I told the, the group there. Six years of activism and persuasion and my partnership with Four Freedoms, because of all of this, the school district in Fairbanks, Alaska has adopted, financed, and distributed gun safety education cards to 12,000 families in 2019 and will continue to pass these cards out to every student in the school district yearly. By providing a model for the state, many gun safety groups now look to Fairbanks as an example of coming together for the safety of our children and community. It is my hope that the state of Alaska will adopt a gun safety education program statewide for all students and families, and I am forever grateful to the brave Alaskans who posed for change by participating in this project and for freedoms for being a partner. Going to LA to share this project and the successes was a very big deal for me, but this is when the pandemic had first started to surface in the US in Seattle where I had to fly through. Not only did I share my art for change project there, but other artists were there to share their voice, how to work together in the future. We had town halls, workshops, just like a congressional convention. Many of the artists that were there were super inspirational for me because I call them my people. They were artists who were also doing um, activist work uh, centered around gun violence. So some of these uh, benches are examples of the billboards that were used uh, around the country in 2018. And they had a bunch of the art there and the artist to share their work. So it was really powerful weekend for me and Jason like we were just talking about this was the last time where I was actually with like tons of people but there was 500 people there and it was a very loving group so everyone was hugging um, but I was very aware of the pandemic I wasn't letting the housekeeper in my hotel every day so I was asking them to stay out I was washing my hands almost after every workshop so even though we were all together celebrating these important moments we were all talking about the pandemic and I was actually pretty shocked when I got home that nobody had caught it there because it was a very um, loving time for everybody. Um, this is a photo of an outdoor workshop we did on how to listen better, how to be a better listener for people that aren't like you and then how to work together for a better future. On the last day of the convention, the Wide Awakes 2020 were introduced by Hank Willis Thomas. For those of you who might not know Hank Willis Thomas, he's there in the black tunic with the orange necklace. He's a very well-known photographer in New York City. Uh, much of his work is based on black history and the politics of that. His mom, Deborah Willis, is a photo historian with many books in her repertoire about black photographic history. And I've been an admirer and follower, follower of their work for a very long time. So uh, Hank Willis Thomas was one of the founders of Four Freedoms, but it's actually a group of people. Um, I, have, I just happen to have a photo of him here. Inspired by the Wide Awakes of 1860, our 2020 awakening takes a cue from this band of abolitionist dreamers and widens the lens. Like them, we're imagining radical visions into reality. We entered February's Congress as delegates of Four Freedoms, but we all emerged wide awakes, aiming for liberation and emancipation, insisting on the future, asking big questions, playing an infinite game. We were the 2020 upgrade. So for those of you that might not be familiar with the wide awakes of the 1860s, they were a group of abolitionists that donned capes, got torches and marched in the streets with posters of eyes to get everyone to be wide awake to come and vote. The urgency for a new world had sounded the call. They invited us to awaken with them. This fall, October 3rd, 2020, presents us with imminent possibility, a chance to commit to a world of healing, listening, and justice. 
The first step was to participate in political processes now, to count ourselves in the census and to vote or to help somebody vote. In the years to come, we were aimed to build a cultural identity around creative civic participation. It's easy as we have seen to tear things apart. The murkier, much more difficult path is to build things together. Our short-term goal as Wide Awakes was to increase, increase voter engagement. Our long-term goal was to build a political and cultural identity around listening, healing, and justice. The values that were instilled were insist on the future, provoke bigger question, present nuanced stories, nour nourish joy, listen until we hear, bridge binaries, be visionary, not reactionary, play an infinite game. The end of the conference was filled with love, music, dancing. Um, an artist from Trinidad had made wonderful, beautiful new 2020 capes. And you can see a lot of the wide awakes wearing them here. And it was a great hopeful event. And I left LA feeling hopeful for the future, but arrived back in Fairbanks scared of the pandemic. So I came to Fairbanks, the pandemic was hitting. Uh, my family, I have two daughters, we were scheduled to go to Juneau to visit my husband for spring break. And all the news of the pandemic was there and nobody knew very much about it. And so it was still very mysterious. And so I had, my dad will be happy about this, but I had gone to Costco. I bought all the cold medicine and Tylenol and coughing medicine, the kids version, everything to have in the house in case we had this pandemic emergency. I mean, I think that's all how we were feeling at the time. So I came home to Fairbanks elated from being born a wide awake and I was going home. I left the conference returning home to work and on a second project, which was taking place in Juneau. So the capital project, for those of you that might not know about this project has been going on for five years. So every year, that my husband has been a legislator, I've gone to Juneau to photograph the people working in the Capitol building. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the project, I'll read you a short summary. I made my first trip to Juneau in 2015 when my husband, Representative Adam Wool, representing District 5 in Alaska, began his first session as a legislator and a polit politician. During this short visit, I fell in love with the Capitol building, a historic and beautiful space. Full of people making a difference for Alaska, I have been photographing there since. In this partisan, divisive, and disruptive atmosphere of local and national politics, it is my hope that viewers can put politics aside and see all the necessary and important people working to make a difference in the Juneau Capitol building. So now, I think Petra gave the March 16th date as the lockdown. So now we're about March 8th. I've come from LA where the pandemic is really starting to hit the US. I've come home to Fairbanks, done my Costco emergency pandemic shopping, and now I've gone to Juneau to work on the capital project. So during the week I was there, every week I've been down there, I invite anybody that works in the building is eligible to participate in the project. So these are screenshots from my website, which is why some of them are cut off. But you'll see uh, representatives, senators, legislators, staff, kids of uh, legislators, lunch ladies, janitors, anybody that works in the Capitol building is allowed to participate in the project. So I was working on this for the week. So while this was going on, the pandemic continued to rage. And at this point, on this particular day, my last day to photograph in the Capitol building, the press was having a conference with three senators, Senator Berta Gar Gardner, Bert Stedman and Senator von Einhoff. And they were discussing how, what was gonna happen with the pandemic and that the Capitol building, this was the last day the Capitol building was gonna be open. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna be able to work on my project. And I had already planned at noon for everybody in the Capitol building to come to the staircase. So this is um, part of the Capitol project, but it's its own photo. So for those of you that might not be familiar with Alfred Eisenstadt, he's a very famous Life Magazine photographer. And he has two famous photos, which are at the bottom of this slide here, one of nurses and one of the military. And those photos 
have always been in my mind. And the first time I ever went to the Capitol building, when I saw the staircase there, I knew I had to revisit Alfred Eisen, Eisenstadt's photos and make new photographs. So the photo on the top left is from a couple years ago. And that was the first revisit of this famous photo that I tried. And then the photo on the right, which was scheduled, scheduled for the last day that the Capitol building was open during the pandemic last year, was the first time I really started to experience people's anxiety about the pandemic. So normally for the photo at noon, I ask everyone to, that works in the building, we send around a building-wide email and everyone comes out of their office, comes to the staircase, looks down, it takes five minutes for me to do the photo and then they go back to work. And it's a very important photo historically because everybody comes together, there's no party lines, party division, there's nothing except everybody working together in the government. And that's really why this photo is important to me. So the photo on the right, a lot of people came out for the shot, but then more people came down the steps to leave the Capitol building and said they didn't wanna be in the photo this year because they didn't feel comfortable being less than six feet. So I was like, okay, gosh, well, this is the first time social distancing is playing a, a role in my photography. And so that was sort of the beginning of the pandemic in the Capitol. Um, after I did this shot, we left the building and I haven't been back since and we're scheduled to go to Juneau March 5th, 2021. And I, the Capitol building is still closed to the public. So last year might've been my last year for the Capitol project, we'll see. Um, but anyway, that's sort of the, the history of that. Now we are starting March 16th. Petra had the exact date. This photo starts the timeline of my pandemic photography. It is a self-portrait. It's the first photo I took when I got home from Fairbanks. Schools were canceled, work was canceled, and everyone was ordered to stay home. If you can see, this is actually a color photo, although it was a very black and white day. These are puddles on a black coffee table that's on my deck. And the first thing I noticed in this self-portrait, which is similar to other pictures I've taken in the past, was my shadow in all the bubbles and also the aspen trees, which are gonna come into play later in this slideshow. But now that I look back on this self-portrait, it really makes me realize that everyone must have felt this way on that day, like trapped in some sort of bubble or whatever situation they were trapped in for the pandemic and it's taken on new meaning. All of the photos I'm getting ready to show you are mostly in chronological order by date and season. They will jump around a bit, but you will start to see different bodies of work starting to emerge. So please be patient with the editing. Also, I'm a little nervous, so excuse my shaky voice. At the beginning of the lockdown, I was I'm, I work for a tech company, um, TechWise Systems, and I work about 30 hours a week doing creative digital services and technology consulting. And so at the beginning of the lockdown, we were very busy at my job helping clients set up their remote work. I was giving Zoom tutorials like three times a day and problem solving. And so every day when I would get off work at two, I would go outside to photograph. I started to notice that I was put escaping the digital screens, the reality of the news, and a lot of my photographs were very simple. They were isolated objects, they were abstractions, very unusual things, shapes, cracks, changes, colorless. There was also divisions, simplicity, intimate moments at my home. And so all of these things were going on um, as this initial lockdown was happening, but my work was really busy. My other job was really busy. And so I was, um, there, was a, there was a lot happening. Every day I would go outside to photograph. And also the other thing that was happening was there was this huge snow that kept falling and falling and then melting and then falling and falling. So there were a lot of, there was a lot of snow.
right around this time, I think it was around um, April 2nd, probably a little bit before that, two photographers from the database of women photograph sent out an email to everyone in the database and invited the database to participate in documenting our pandemic situations. And hundreds, hundreds of us signed up from all over the world. We turned our cameras on ourselves instead of the regular photojournalism of telling other stories of other people. And that was a first for many of the photographers. Revolutionary in its storytelling, the Journal Collective became more than documenting the pandemic. Within the larger group, smaller groups were formed representing different regions within each group. Those groups were encouraged to meet for support, for fun, for picture sharing. My group was group 30. A lot of photographers were out of work because they couldn't travel and some were even stuck in countries on assignments and in lockdown, unable to leave. Katrine Stryker from Berlin gave a quote and these slides, I actually didn't make these slides. I have to give the credit to the Journal Collective for these. Um, these are screenshots from a Zoom meeting that we had. The journal helped, uh, I feel very much the same way as this quote, so I'm gonna read it to you. The journal helped me pick up my camera during the first days of the pandemic to document my family during these insecure and strange times. I don't know whether I would have had the strength to do that without having such an inspiring network by my side. I think the document that we are creating now, giving such personal insights will be extremely valuable and important in the years to come when the pandemic is finally over. The exchange within our small groups was and is so important, not only for being creative, but also from the human perspective. This was a pivotal moment for me. I began to see my work in a much bigger, more historical context, a collective global experience, a new way of storytelling, much like my experience with the Four Freedoms and the Wide Awakes group, which was also a collaborative effort. The group invited us to, the Journal Collective invited us to submit to themes weekly and they asked well-known photo editors and female photographers to edit these themes in a curated fashion. And then they would post these themes on their Instagram site. Um, these are some of the themes that they have asked for us to contribute to. Childhood, transit, cycle change, resilience, love, nourish, fear, routine, nature, connection, self-portrait, time, windows, all the things that we're all feeling on a global scale. Um, this is a great screenshot of Maggie Sturber, who's a well-known female photographer, she gave a video to the Journal Collective um, thanking us for this revolutionary way of storytelling. And to the right are other curators, which are very well-known female and women, female curators and women curators around the world. I started to think of my more personal private moments as a collective experience felt by so many artists around the world. I started to see the work as part of being a human dealing with a global pandemic, the worst global experience of fear in my lifetime. This is the first photo I took after joining the collective, a heart photo. At the time, people were dying in Italy, starting to die in New York, and I wanted to send love for people around the world. The moon was shining bright in the aspen forest outside my house and the sky was a beautiful blue. I slowed down my shutter speed, wanting to, sh to make a heart with the moon. Of course, if you've tried this before, you have to actually do your camera upside down to make the heart, which I learned the hard way. But I, after a few tries, I had a success. I submitted this to the time theme for the journal collective and it was selected for their feed. These are some of the more personal private moments that I started to see as the collective experience. It made me think about the work in a different way beyond just photographing my immediate family. How people were dealing with remote school, how everyone was stuck at home, how for some people that was a good situation and for some people that was a bad situation. For some students, they thrived at home where others suffered some weren't safe at home, some were. The holidays came and went. The things that we all were used to doing together, which now we were doing alone. 
it just made me think about the work differently. Funny moments with pets. Our pets have been a great relief during the pandemic. This is a fun photo of the actual timeline of the of the um, all of the snowmen. One snowman that we made at the beginning of the lockdown, which lasted till the end of the lockdown and beyond. And you can see just how elastic the snow is, and just sort of the time it took to, for the snowman to actually fall. Then my husband came home from Juneau because they closed the Capitol early and we weren't really sure how to navigate this pandemic. So he quarantined in our basement for two weeks and we could see him once a day walking. And here you can see we're trying to practice our six feet of social distance. The lockdown ended and we started to get out a little bit more, although everywhere we went was empty. The roads were empty, the parking lots were empty. Everything just felt ominous and uncertain. Plus it was still snowing. This is waiting in the parking lot at Safeway. I had started work a couple years ago of the aspen forest in our yard. The photos I was taking weren't satisfying my art brain. And so I started using a slower shutter speed to really make the aspen trunks more distinct with really dark, almost black lines. These pandemic landscapes, we'll call them the aspen pandemic landscapes, are grouped throughout this slideshow together chronologically. So you can see how the body of work is building throughout the year. During the pandemic, I also started thinking differently about these landscapes. That initially the quality of light in the sky was the origin, but I began to realize it was also sentiment. That stepping out to photograph the Aspen was a way to have a moment of sentiment to myself and the photos took on a new meaning. Not all of the Aspen photos are motion shots, but a clearer body of pandemic Aspen landscapes is starting to emerge. Because of the Journal Collective, my photos took a new meaning of collective global pandemic experience with regional and cultural differences. The black and white work in the rest of the slideshow, slide excuse me, is for this collective recording of our human global pandemic experience. The pandemic reality was ever present. Work was very busy. People were starting to die and my family was there 24 seven.
now spring was ending. This is about May 15th, maybe May 17th. And school was fizzling out. <clears throat> the pandemic was very real still. And everywhere people were starting to make masks normal. My daughter made a tribute to the essential workers. If you can see really closely, those are little people banging pots and pans, much like they were doing in Italy and New York at a certain time of day, thanking healthcare workers. My friends and I were trying to navigate how to be social. This is my first birthday party, social distance birthday party um, with cupcakes. We didn't even know if we should eat them. High schools were moving all of their graduations on, on line and on TV. We had some families who's, who had seniors and it was a very difficult time because all of the normal routine of graduation was just, it fizzled out. It was really hard to sort of still celebrate. So they had parades to make uh, this graduates feel special. They decorated and we all went and cheered for the graduates. And um, this photo, this next photo is very, uh, a lot of people's feeling of, of the pandemic. Scary, scary 2020. So summer, summer came, the leaves came and school just fizzled out. It was really strange because it didn't even feel like anything. My daughter finished fourth grade with a, with a happy summer sign and that was it. No goodbye to friends. My other daughter finished seventh grade. It was the same. It was just this really weird, okay, summer's starting. So we celebrated the last day of, of summer with fresh lemonade. And this photo was chosen for the nourishment theme on the Journal Collective and shared on their Instagram feed. So summer started and we just sort of thought about our lives in a new way. And we started making some changes. We started our own garden because we had experienced the threat of food insecurity during the lockdown and thought about it for the rest of the people in the world. And so the girls actually did it all themselves. They made a small garden and we started to grow food. And the reality of the pandemic was starting to be a lot more normal. Mike, you'll like this picture. Mike Conti and the bookmobile came up from Anchorage and we were able to experience a, a mobile library which was great because we had all done reading. My daughter's flute class um, improvised and had a six feet apart group lessons, rain or shine. And I just thought it was so interesting how humans just adapted. Um, races had staggered starts with mandatory masks and that was all new for our family who had taken up training for the whole summer and running races. And, and so every human in the world was trying to make sense of our new reality and, and how to move forward and still keep up our spirits. I was also still escaping into my Aspen pandemic landscapes. So being 50, I got new progressive lens this year and that's what I'm wearing right now. And I was having a lot of trouble focusing my camera. And so I started practicing focus with my macro lens in the yard. And I've been working on a, another project for a long time called Tiny Beauty. Alaska is always known for its vastness and grandiose existence, but there is Tiny Beauty also. I expanded the project this year to include species not natural or native to Alaska. And so I began to practice around the yard. You can see the Tiny Beauty Project, on my, more of it on my website, but these are some of the images that got me through the pandemic in the summer. Really focusing on small things and appreciating mother nature. Some of these were shared also in our uh, journal collective Instagram feed.
I call this one pandemic yin yang. During the rest of the summer, our family started doing small camping trips as often as we could. We'd go to Denali, the White Mount Mountains, Mount Prindle Campground, Quartz Creek Trail, anywhere in the wilderness. Wilderness and nature was a great healer for pandemic fatigue. How lucky we are in Alaska to have the beauty and access to so much wilderness. We felt safe, away from the news, and were able to find peace something many of the journal collective photographers were not experiencing around much of the world, mostly because of be living in uh, big population centers. We took family trips, we laughed, we camped, we cried, we stayed in our own bubbles and still tried to have what we considered a normal routine. There have been many moments during this pandemic where I have been glad the world has had to slow down. Before the pandemic, it was going at a very fast pace. Families have lost loved ones, lost jobs, lost healthcare. We feel very fortunate every day. So right around this time, I was also experiencing a lot of pandemic fatigue like everybody. I had the opportunity to photograph a very young bull moose in our yard and you can see where the jungle gym is. It's rare to be so close so I took advantage 
and I crept from the deck to the climbing wall that you can see and climbed up in the jungle gym where the moose was not afraid. It's rare to be so close, so I took advantage and I noticed while I was photographing this young male moose in the tree was this beautiful hornet's nest. And it made me immediately think of Edward Monk's The Scream. And so I wanted to take the nest down, but it was midsummer and there was still a ton of wasp or hornets in it. And so I looked up on the internet how to save a paper wasp nest. And it said basically, take, take a paper bag over it, take it off the tree, put it in the freezer for a few days, kill the, ant, kill the bees, and then you'll be done. Well, it was too scary to do that midsummer. So I waited till the fall. I would shake the branch to make sure there was no bees coming out of it, wasps coming out of it. I took a ladder, I pulled it off the um, branch at the end of the summer. By now it had been frost, I think three times. So there, it was pretty safe. But I put a bag around it, put it in the freezer and then took it out. And they had the concept to do a um, pandemic self-portrait, the scream revisited. So you can see my attempts here. I'm trying to do it myself. I'm still having focus and placement problems. You can see my chin here. And I finally enlisted the help of my daughters. And we did a series of self-portraits with leaf throwing and flash work. And the last two are my favorite, but you can sort of see the process here of going through and trying to do a pandemic self-portrait, the screen revisited. The last two are my favorites, but uh, if anybody has any other favorites, you can tell me at the end. I'm still undecided on the final one. After looking at these self-portraits, I started to go back uh, over my work in the, in the past year because now we're to the fall. The leaves are falling, you see they're all yellow. Winter is coming. And I started to find self-portraits that sort of were linked together, different from this one, of course. Um, the first one I found was a 50, the, year, the day that I turned 50 years old, isolated on the top of Quartz Creek Trail in the White Mountains, and that's this one. Mike, I wanna see a self-portrait of you on your birthday too. The rest are me being squeezed in a frame of light trapped with trees or shadows like prison bars. And it made me think about the pandemic in a different way. Although I didn't feel in my heart like I was trapped, there must have been some sentiment of that over time. Maybe I was feeling it for other people. The Journal Collective was de defining itself more and more as a revolution of storytelling, a global collaboration, and people were taking notice. My group 30 was set to take over the Instagram feed, and so we had started Zooming to work on concepts and sequencing the images. Um, the Journal Collective did come up with a mission statement, and I'll just read it here. We are an established global photography collective of several hundred women who have come together to create a profound avenue for connection, creativity, and support. It offers equal and diverse representation as we push to be seen and hired by decision makers. It gives insight into the lives of women around the world and empowers photographers beyond the collective. My group 30 was set to take over the Instagram feed and so we had started Zooming to work on concept, concepts and sequencing the images. My group consisted of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, but seven photographers, six photographers, seven. Whitney Curtis from St. St. Louis, Missouri, Kathleen Flynn from New Orleans, Louisiana, Florence Kupel from Peru, Anna Claire Spellman based in Arizona and in Istanbul, Turkey, 
and not pictured here are Tali Kimmelman from Uruguay and Fabiola Cedillo from uh, Ecuador. And so it was really great. I feel like I have new friends now around the world and Heather who's on the call, who I, who's not in my group, but I feel connected to her also. Um, I have made new friends around the globe and sharing photographs and talking about photography has been a great highlight of this pandemic time. So we met together a few times um, before the Instagram feed in our Zoom, and this is sort of the process. Um, I've put the Instagram and website, if they have it, on every photographer's um, images. These are Anna's images. So we went through everybody's images. We put them all in a Dropbox folder, and then we were on the Zoom call together to sort of organize them into a sequence for our Instagram takeover. It was just so interesting to me how everybody's experience around these different regions in the world were so different, but collectively, all of our sentiment was the same, even on the Zoom calls. This is Fabiola's work. Florence's work was very interesting because she was receiving emergency funds um, from Nat Geo, and I think the Photography Humanity Museum, because she was documenting medicinal cures for the pandemic with the indigenous people of Peru. So a lot of her work revolved around um, this medicinal um, documents that she, documentation that she was, was working on. These are mine, of course, you've seen all of these now. These are Tali's from Uruguay. She's mostly a commercial and fine art photographer. Whitney Curtis, who's a photojournalist in St. Louis, very well known for her photojournalism of the Black Lives Matter movements that have been taking place there, among other things. So around October 3rd, our group took over the Instagram feed and you can see it on the Journal Collective's Instagram site, but this is, I have four days of our sequence of images. So we work together to choose one photo from each photographer and then we, we put them in a sequence and then that was our takeover. It was a lot of work. This is my favorite one of the of the six days that we had. The three days, six posts, excuse me. The Journal Collective has had exhibitions globally. The Athens Photo Festival, Festival in Sao Paulo, which is a very interesting exhibition because it was in a very public transit area, but it was a very private, intimate, global pandemic perspective. So I thought that was a sort of an interesting way to show that work. And in the Hong Kong Press Club, each region of the world had a different leader. And so those people were reaching out to find curators for these festivals. And of course, Photoville in New York City. By fall, the pandemic was still raging and it was decided that school would start remote only. We were adjusting to the new pandemic normality. Staying away from people, remote school. Um, this next picture is the first day of fifth grade for my daughter, who's only just now met her teacher in person since school started back in, in January. This photo was also in the Journal Collective's routine theme. About this time, my dear friend's dad passed away unexpectedly, not from COVID, but it, COVID affected it anyway. My friend came from LA by himself without his wife and daughter to be by his side. The beautiful service was the sweetest, most special, socially distant and heartfelt afternoon. We were all thinking about death beyond that service and the loss that the pandemic was affecting worldwide.
There was a rainbow on the drive home telling us that everything was gonna be okay. Fall came, the seasons were changing and division and death was ever present in the news and in our country. Our favorite escape to the White Mountains was damaged maybe for decades. Sorry, I got a little ahead of the slides there. These are fall pictures. Our favorite escape to the White Mountains was damaged maybe for decades from inexperienced hunters when they opened a section of the Alaskan wilderness um, to more hunting. Caribou carcasses were left, were illegally left and four wheelers damaged the tundra. And even though the light snow covered the sadness, we entered the winter prepared to change the ills of the nation. October 3rd was the introduction and marching of the Wide Awakes with a month leading up to our election and one of the most important for our democracy in my lifetime. Wide Awakes was what I talked about at the beginning. The Wide Awakes had sent open source logos, fonts, and rules of the game. The Wide Awakes are a network of like minds who create in the name of liberation, artist sovereignty, and the evolution of society. The Wide Awakes are a decentralized group coming together where we can in creation and collaboration. All that is needed to participate is the willingness to ask the question, open your eyes and jump in. With the open source branding that they sent, the font, the eyes and examples of what we could use, I created a Wide Awakes Alaska Instagram feed and started to work on concepts for displaying, posting art and sharing it far and wide. I had been working on concepts for a Wide Awakes poster, which was going to share digitally on Wide Awakes Alaska Instagram feed and print to put up locally. I was playing with the eye icon and the cape on motive in different ways and not really finding a concept that I like, that I liked. Then on September 18th, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away and had another art for change idea. I knew this would be difficult in pandemic times with a call for participants, but we set up an outdoor studio with safety protocols to photograph and about 24 people showed up, mostly family and friends. Um, basically, I invited people to come do a a uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg tribute portrait, and I had the cape from my dad's friend who passed away. About 20 people, 24 people showed up, mostly family and friends, some of whom brought their own collars that were special or had been handmade by a relative. I photographed, photographed them with my friend's dad's cape, graduation cape, so it made it even more special, and also with the link to the Wide Awakes cape on. From these portraits, I then started to make posters using a collage of imagery from the 1860s Wide Awake art to the open source branding that I received from the Wide Awake, from the Wide Awakes 2020. The next three examples are the finished posters leading up to the November 3rd election that I used to share and post widely. I also found um, this image of the American flag on the internet and used that. These are the final posters. And you can see the collage effect of the old imagery mixed in with them. I also started to put RBG on there and some Alaska specific or Alaska flag imagery to sort of make it Alaska unique. And these, these posters were used to invite civic participation in democracy. I also made a new quote illegal billboard for the parks highway and help, had help putting up the, its sleuth style on the side of the road to encourage voting.
Since the election, I have been photographing mostly winter, continuing tiny beauty in my Aspen forest pandemic landscapes. The snowflakes began to represent the Journal Collective and the Four Freedoms Group, how individually we are unique, but collectively we can make an impact. It ex I expanded the motion shots beyond the yard. I've also expanded my motion shots beyond the yard, but always come back to the Aspen. The new year came bringing us all new beginnings, hope with new leadership, vaccine distributions, schools starting back, connections made despite the loneliness and isolations of the pandemic. I want to thank my family for their love, happiness, fun, and patience during this past year. It is with them I have spent the most time. They have been the best quarantine mates anyone could ask for. I would also like to thank Women Photograph, the Journal Collective, Four Freedoms, and the Wide Awakes for making art and artists a collective and collaboration, revolutionizing creativity, civic participation, and storytelling. And of course, last but not least, thank you, APC, for inviting me to give this virtual presentation, Pandemic Photography, a Year of Isolation, Innovation, Collaboration, and Connection. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Kate, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. That was pretty amazing. Yeah. I think I went a little over, sorry. I was trying to give the slides enough time to reach everyone's internet connection. No, it was, it was great, uh, amazing work. What struck me, I kept thinking, you know how images can feel noisy, but I always, kept thinking they exude so much silence. I love the what you did with the uh, wasp nest. Thank Those you. Great. I felt like that at the time, you know, like, oh, the pandemic. So I have a comment on the wasp nest. I, I, I love it. It's, it is so like, you know, the monk scream um, I wonder, and I don't know how you would do this, but the fact that it is a wasp nest and not a paper mache thing, or you know something that you made rather than found, it would be it would maybe add to the to the um, experience if if folks somehow could know that it was a made by wasps or whatever they are hornets. I don't know the difference between a wasp and a bee, really. Your mother nature never ceases to amaze me. Well, it was such a great narrative, Kate, from from March of last year and 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 your last social interactions and and uh, you know several several times I was very moved by your the the silent slideshows and and I just I felt the silence of you know of of the pandemic and uh, so it was great presentation. And, and great images, good work. Thank you, I Kate, it'll, it'll be interesting to, you know, see a year from now, it, it would be um, very interesting 
to see a similar um, story told by you um, about 2021. Mm. Yeah, I think for, for me, the pandemic has been loneliest from my family that doesn't live in Fairbanks. But for me also the connections to other artists around the world has been almost greater because I've been able to have access to people that I never would have met before through these collectives and collaborations. And it's, it feels promising for the future where everyone can work together to solve problems and the artists are always the first ones, right? So yeah. all of you guys can have hope, can have hope. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see that there, there does seem to be light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, yeah, I, I am hopeful, certainly. So Kate, one thing I was struck by was just the, the quantity of images and it, it, it made me think, well, you have your camera with you all the time. Mm -hmm. is, is that true or did you, if you're just thinking about how you approach the whole project, do you, do you just have it with you all the time and when you see something, you grab it? Yeah, or, otherwise, or, otherwise you miss it. When you see a picture, you gotta take it right then. I, I, I kind of think it's interesting sometimes because when you go to artist lectures, you always see the best work, right? <laughs> but this work is all really new. And some of the work is kind of interesting to see the process because we don't always get to learn from other people. Like that's how I learn the most is from other artists is how they think about the work. For me, it's really hard to talk about it. So the timing of this lecture was kind of perfect because it gave me enough time to sort of go through it all and piece it together. And working chronologically was the easiest for me, even though it separated the work a little bit weird sometimes for you all, but. It was, it, it was great. Um, yeah, I, I'm glad that um, you got something out of it as well doing this tonight. So um, thank you. And I encourage you all to follow the Journal Collective on Instagram and to check out their website and they're doing pretty amazing things and no one's getting paid from it. It's all dedication to photography and storytelling and dealing with the pandemic and having friendships. It's been really special and also to to be wide awake in the future. Anybody can be wide awake. You don't have to just go to their website and play the game. It's for everybody. Kate, I Do have you think a question. They oh, sorry, oh, buddy, go. go. No, that's okay. I'm changing subject. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say with the wide awakes, what I thought was interesting, it's, uh, I, I, and I don't know how that symbol came about obviously seeing and being wide awake, but it reminds me of warding off the evil eye. It was real imagery used in the 1860s with the abolitionists. So they sort of just updated it. Cool. I, I found that the, I don't know if that was a teardrop or a raindrop or an oil drop in the pupil. Mm -hmm. was, was that part of the original abolitionist um, logo? I can look at the art. I don't think so. I think that was a modern take on it. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. No, I don't see the teardrop in those old posters. Kate, I was just gonna ask, I really love the Aspen series. And I was wondering just what direction that you're shooting them in. You mean or are like they all? Are they all around you? <laughs> so where I'm sitting right now, if I walk that way out my door is my deck, which is actually on the second floor of our house. So it's all Aspen there. And then if I walk that way out the front door, then it's all Aspen behind us. So it's <laughs> everywhere. Wow. So most of the light in the sky is there being backlit. So that's why I'm able to get those really dark lines. 
with painting with those really dark lines because they're backlit from the light. It's just beautiful. Thank you. They are, they're, they're so gorgeous and it was just so wonderful. I've seen one here, one there, and but just to see a whole grouping of them was lovely. Can you talk about the process of when you're making them? Are you hand holding and going like this with the camera or how are you doing it? Well, I'll just show you. So usually it's like sunset or sunrise, which is really long in Alaska. And so I'm shooting at 125 ISO because I'm still stuck on the 125 from my film days. So I just always shoot on that. And then I slow down my shutter speed. Usually it's an eighth or slower. I just go like this. <laughs> sort of draw with the camera. So depending on how long the shutter speed is, I'm either going up and down or I'm just going one way. And it usually, I can see right away if I have a success because the lines are pretty straight instead of going sideways. So yes, I'm just holding it. Just does it matter. Does it matter where you're pushing the button at all? You mean when? Yeah, when in your motion, does it matter when you're hitting the trigger, the shutter? I'll think about it. Let's see, it's just like, like that. Usually in the beginning. It's a lot of trial and error from my experience. Sorry? A lot of trial and error from my experience. I've gotten a lot better at it, John. I know what the light can look like exactly how I want the trees now, so it's easier. I got bored of just taking the aspen. That's one body of work that's really grown immensely during this pandemic is the Aspen landscapes because I was doing them before. I just have more time now. So I guess a, a question I, I hear a lot, this is not an original question, but what's next? What, what do you have on your to-do list or your creative plan? That's a good question, Matt. Well, I'll quote Ralph Gibson because I just attended his webinar on Thursday, which has been another great thing for the pandemic. I've been able to see in my living room this close, Ralph Gibson talk about his work, Vic Munich's one of my favorite photographers from Brazil and Abelardo Morel in Boston. And Ralph Gibson said, you're only as great as your next photograph. So that's what I'm thinking about. I'm not really sure yet. I'm continuing to work on the pandemic documentation with the Journal Collective. I'll, that's really given me a lot to think about. But I don't have any, it's hard to work on one project for me. I always have a bunch going on. It's really hard to talk about work. It's easier just to show it. Kate, we don't want to keep you too late. Well, but thank you all for being are there, Thank you. Yeah, are there any other questions out there before we let you go? No. It's nice to see so many familiar faces and family and friends on here. Thanks everybody for being here. It means a lot. Well, thank you. And you have to let us know when you're going to be in Anchorage and hopefully sometime this summer we can, we can get together and uh, yeah, and actually see each other in the flesh. That would be great. I would love that. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Yeah, that would be lovely. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. Well. Thanks all. Bye. Yeah. Good Thanks. to meet you, Kate. Bye. Ken. <laughs> Bye. Bye.